<laughs> now we are live. I believe we are live. Yes, I already see someone is already tuned. <laughs> First second. Wah! Si tumepigwa hapa na character development. <laughs> hey man, welcome guys to our live show here on Friday Live here on Shared Moments with Justice. You know, we're laughing because we've been taught a lesson. Yani, the day when everything seems to be working, we've had all the time to prep. We've been laughing here all afternoon. And then just some minutes to go live, we find we realize we've been talking to ourselves for the last 10 minutes. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We've been talking to ourselves for 10 minutes. 10 good minutes. And this guy here doesn't even, you know, tell us we are talking to ourselves. <laughs> Oh man, it's, no, it's not acceptable. How could we be talking to ourselves for 10 minutes for a show that we prepared for the whole day? We've been here all afternoon preparing for this show, and then suddenly we are here. Uh, I, I, no, no, uh, it's gonna be a good show, it's a sign of good things, right? Yeah, but nevertheless, as you can see, tonight is massive. I'm not just here by myself like you used to seeing me alone. It is, uh, I mean, I'm safe. Eh? I'm joined by an amazing lady. And I'm going to show, you know, tell you why she's an amazing lady. Because the story that we are going to have tonight, <laughs> you'll never forget this day. So sit back, relax. If you have a mug of coffee or tea, this is that time. I'm really excited about tonight's show because it's not just about sharing stories, but stories that are transformative in nature. And we have seen so much already here in studio. So drum rolls for my guest. Drum rolls, drum rolls, drum rolls for my guest. Hey, how are you? Are you excited? I'm excited. Huh. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy. I feel blessed. You've been laughing yeah. the whole time? Yeah, it's a good day. <laughs> you know, when you're sharing testimony, you're sharing something that is going to obviously touch one or two people. Yeah. There's joy already. There's so much joy. Oh, great. Even God given joy. It's exciting. I am looking forward myself to this conversation, really. And uh, let me just say this. We introduced this segment for Friday Live to be a little more intimate and to talk about things that are personal, things that are of concern to you. Because this is the only time you have an opportunity to have a real-time interaction and for us to be able to engage on issues that really matter. And so tonight, it's going to be nothing less. It's going to be... I think this is the best show. So if you've not sent this link to any of your friends, oh man, don't let anyone miss out on this one. Please, I'll give you some minutes to just go and you know share that link. Make sure everybody's on board before we go too far. Because we don't want people trying to rewind in the middle of the live show. Nah, 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 nah. So here's your opportunity. Please keep sharing this link and invite as many people as you can. Because this is the story that you've all been waiting for here on Shared Moments with Justice. And let me now have the honors of introducing to you my guest tonight, one and only Nkatha Mwenda, the only one with two local beautiful names. <laughs> eh, Sasa. <laughs> You're looking good. Hey, thank you. I feel blessed. Yes. God is good. Ah. Yeah, and he's gone before us. You know. Karibu, karibu sana. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 interesting because uh, we've known each other uh, for a very short time, and yet for the moments we've spent here on set just preparing for this particular show, we've been chatting and interacting as if we've, we've known each other for the last 10 years. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, it's, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> It's a lot of things. Okay. Yeah, but that should tell you one thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, what can you say? It's Wow. There's lots coming. Yeah. With all this. Yes. Because when you connect with someone, uh, automatically, people struggle, you know, when mm. it's conversation-wise. There's something good in store. 
Wow. I don't think this is the only time. I'll Maybe divine. Here. Uh-huh. Obviously, uh-huh. obviously God ordained. Yeah. Because yeah. let me just tell them how we first met. Yeah, sure. Before we go to the story. <laughs> because I'm waiting for them to bring me more people on the live chat. And I want to hear from you. Let me know what you're saying, where you're watching from. And uh, what you think tonight's show is about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So about a week ago, I... I saw a tag on my Instagram. Someone has done, had done a post and tagged shared moments. And as always, I go through all tags and messages and you know all those kind of things. And so I was interested because the post that I had been tagged in was talking about an experience that this particular lady had as a result of uh, a guest that she met through shared moments with Justus. And the story was so touching that I sent her a message and told her I would love to hear the rest of the story. And she was gracious enough to get back to me and that's now history. Yeah. We are here today <laughs> with Nkatha yeah. because of that particular incident that happened not so long ago. Mm -hmm. And so for her to be sitting here, you can be sure uh, there's quite a story behind mm -hmm. and uh, I just want to say thank you so much for really uh, accepting my call to come and uh, be part of this live show mm -hmm. and embarrass me uh, <laughs> on live TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's really a pleasure mm -hmm. to have you on board. You. Yeah, so I think now we are ready to really know who you are and why you're here yes. and uh, to have our audience, uh, you know, also benefit from your knowledge, wisdom, experience, and all those things. Yeah. So let me give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, mm -hmm. and then uh, we pick it from there. Okay. Yes. Oh, well, Justice, it's great to be seated here. Uh, like you said, um, a tag got, got your attention, yeah. which is great. <laughs> Many people ignore tags. Um, so the message here is keep tagging. If you have something that you need to share, keep tagging. Um, my name is Nika Famunda. I, I love Jesus. He is my personal savior. Um, I'm a mother. Um, I'm a nutritionist by profession for about 15 years now. Mm. And, um, and I'm an alcohol and drug awareness advocate. I run, we run um, a community-based organization called Graceful Youth Recovery Center. It's based in Campbell County, and our work is just to add the voice um, on prevention, on alcohol, on addictions, and also we have set up a center where we are taking care of those people who can't afford rehab, those women who are in the street, yeah. they're addicted, number one. Number two, they're conscious sex workers. Um, trading for as little as 50 shillings, 100 shillings. Um, what even is shocking is this is our second, third generation uh, commercial sex workers because aunties, mothers before them did this trade. And for me, um, it is the cry of the child. You know, I kept asking God, why have you led me in that direction? Mm -hmm. But it's about the child, the children, these women have. There are many children. And if nothing is done, then these children will grow up by the age of 10, 11, they are commercial sex workers. The boys will have drifted into the street of street boys. So it just, it could be just that one person that needs the help. And it has already started happening. So Campbell is new to be in that space. Wow. <laughs> I just had instructions this year in March. You need to share your story on how you recovered from alcoholism in 2016. And uh, keep sharing your story, encourage um, so that we break stigma, mm -hmm. so that we understand that addiction um, is, prevent is preventable and also treatable. That's it. Addiction. And it's not only alcohol, substance abuse. We're talking about gambling. We're yeah. talking about sex addiction, you know, like pornography, masturbation, um, um, Food disorders. It's, you know, these are addictions. Um, social media. The people who can't get off their phones, or off Twitter, or 
you know, such kind of things. So we're talking about addictions in general. Mm -hmm. That addictions are preventable. And if you're addicted to anything, it's just a state. It is treatable. So that's what I see. And you see, for you, Nkatha, you're coming out now, not so long ago to start yeah. speaking and being vocal about this, uh, <clears throat> these things, addiction and all that. But your story goes way back. <laughs> and, and this yeah. is the story that actually gives you the moral authority to actually talk about these things, addiction. Yeah. I, I listened to your story and I was amazed. Number one, that you're here today. <laughs> but on the other side, I'm happy because God has preserved you yeah. this far yeah. for a reason. And you are the voice of reason yeah. in a yeah. space where people are not sober, <laughs> you know, so to speak. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And when we're talking about issues of drug addiction, alcoholism, we most, in most cases, relate this to the male you know, gender. Yeah. And we, <clears throat> we have had stories, a lot of stories about men who are struggling with addiction, whose lives have been messed up because of alcohol yeah. and those other substances. We hardly hear, we know there are women who are also struggling, but we hardly hear this mm -hmm. story from women. Yeah. And so having you here to, you know, just come and say that these things are not just foreign, yeah. are not foreign to women, in itself, I think, is a good place to be. Yes. Let me take you back. Mm. Because there's a place where all this madness or mayhem yeah. began. Yeah. At what point did you find yourself warming up to alcohol? Because mm. this is something that then, for a very big part or better part of your life, mm. has you know really taken you <laughs> to the rock bottom. <laughs> but where did yeah. all this start and, and how did that even happen? Yeah, it's, we have to speak up. Yes, it's true. Women don't talk about, uh, not many women come out to admit they struggled and, and yet there are so many. And yeah. uh, we are happy when people recover. My adding my voice again, like I say, is that was an instruction and an obedience to mm. share so that um, the stigma that comes with uh, being a woman who was an alcoholic or is in an addiction of some sort is not to look down upon that people can be empathetic. You know, if someone needs help, be kind. Don't say, oh, that's a woman. I can introduce as a woman, you know, instead of saying it's true. So where it all began was um, when I was a teen, an 18 year old. Grew up well. Um, very stable family. Um, I remember uh, after high school getting into um, flying school. My dream was always to be a pilot and um, fly uh, the national carrier. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Dreams are valid, you know, it's still there. I will fly planes, make yeah. my own. So um, my father took, my parents took me to flying school. So in flying school, um, it was a new environment for me in terms of interacting with um, a diverse kind of people. I had always been in a girls-only kind of school in high school. Yeah. Um, it was a boarding school. Pretty sheltered, protected. Protected. Yeah. Shielded. So I, yes, shielded. And, 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 and you know, I appreciate the shielding because out of it also a lot of... Um, I applied quite a number of uh, guiding principles. So in flying school, I am minding my business studying. <laughs> and obviously, we are social beings. Yes. And, and I got into, I would obviously, I, I would talk with uh, my classmates. And I didn't understand how it, it became so easy then for us to, sh to share what we do or the things that we like. Mm -hmm. Because one day I was introduced to cigarettes and it was something very ca casual. My friend just says, oh, you know, I, I, I normally take this. Have you ever tried? And I said, no, I never. I wouldn't even dare. They said, just go try it. The next thing um, is a drink after school. You know, you go to class, 
it's, if you're not flying that day, or it could have been either, uh, I think, flying or it's ground school. Yeah. So after classes, we'd pass mm -hmm. through the, mm -hmm. the, the pub and have one or two. But how easy I, was it for I you at that point? I because was curious. I yeah. was curious. Number one, these are things that you've been warned against. Oh my goodness, my parents, like I said, were really sheltered and yeah. brought up in a strict uh, kind of um, home. So those things that um, we were told don't are the ones that looked attractive to do. Mm. So here is someone who's casually saying, you know, here is this, uh, we'll go and try, you know, something like that. That's why it's very important to to know peer pressure is positive and negative. And negative can, can cost you. Positive is good. You know, if you're yeah. all ganging up to do something good, that's nice. You know. But now this is something that uh, was drugs and I tried. So smoking I, I, I did smoke. Drinking, I tried it and continued drinking. But that was just casual problem. Wow. Yeah. So when I, I when I got my license, I was getting ready to um, proceed to pursue my commercial license. I assumed I'd do it. Uh, I, I'd study abroad. Um, it was usually cheaper, you know. <laughs> so I've already looked for prospectuses. <laughs> I've already prepared them for my father to see. <laughs> I know I knew I was either going to Texas in America or South Africa mm -hmm. first. You know, those those are just some of the places where. There's quite a number, it's good climate throughout the year, and there's quite a number of flying schools. So let me sure maybe behold. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps just take you back a little yeah. bit because you found yourself in a space, you know, where really it's a new territory. Mm -hmm. You're now, you know, experimenting with, yes, with alcohol, we're experimenting yeah. with, you know, every other thing that comes your way in terms of a drug or a substance, yes, alcohol <laughs> you know, and alcohol yeah. and cigarette, yeah. you know. So, and you did that until you cleared your course. Um, you know, we, we, um, did that raise any, you know, because your parents, as you said, were yeah, strict obviously. or some, did, did it occur to them that uh, something was going on at that point or at what point did they then uh, realize that? Uh, Let me paint a picture. You, you, in, in school, you're not doing it every day. Maybe it's okay. on a Friday, around on Friday, and that's when you catch up and maybe have a drink. Get home, obviously alcohol has a smell. There are quite a number of times I was asked what is going on, you know. And I would quickly say, um, I'd stop. It's just that uh, someone gave me this and this, and uh, I'm sorry, and it didn't happen again. So mm -hmm. obviously they were concerned. They didn't keep quiet because obviously when you're drinking, uh, it doesn't matter if you have had one bottle or two, there's a smell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're tipsy, obviously you don't <laughs> act the way you normally act. Mm -hmm. um, the drinking was not every day. It was once in a while. Yeah. Uh, but I also remember um, mm, the day before I did my ground test. <laughs> I, I must have gone out the night before. I don't understand where I used to get what do you energy. Mean? <laughs> yeah. But I had drinks maybe till late. So that the next day I was taken to um, we used to do our tests at the at, at the uh, then it was called DCU. Yeah, the actual of civil aviation. So my father drove me to to my test. In fact it wasn't at DCU, it was a place I think I'm told by but my father did take me. My father did take me to uh, uh, do my exams. And the night before you had... And the night before, you know you wake up and you know, I, I'm not drunk, but I have a hump. And I, if I can still remember that day till today, that it must have been worrying. <laughs> I'm wondering, did, did my father notice anything? <laughs> I did my test. I passed with flying colors, but... <laughs> There was something amiss about that yeah. whole scenario. But my parents have, have been um, um, very supportive, even as I speak about the experiences of the past. But when they notice something amiss, they always try to intervene. Wow. When you're drinking or doing all this 
kids that you get addicted to, you become an expert in masking or lying, mm. or even you avoid people, situations, so that they don't think you 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 do those things. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. yes. That there's a big chunk of my life when I was drinking that many people didn't know who I was and people close to me because I would deliberately be away from them. Mm-hmm. Or I would also call myself for a meeting and then stop drinking for a while. It is towards the end that it became uncontrollable, just before I stopped. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's what you're talking about, actually, I have uh, seen a lot, especially with young people, mm-hmm. uh, those in schools, even high school, and you know, and unfortunately, right now there are a lot of young people in high school, secondary school, yeah. who are hooked yes. to alcohol and some of these other drugs, mm. but their parents have no idea, no clue. They have a way of masking it and you know doing it, and yet even those who are closest to them have you know mm. would would swear to God that you know their kids have never seen labor alone tested. And yes, and yeah. it's, you become an expert. You say liar or, you know, you're able to mask it. Um, you just reminded me of messages I get on my WhatsApp, in my Instagram. Um, so most of my posts about alcohol, drugs, and all those things. Mm. So I remember someone uh, sharing and saying that they didn't know their son was taking drugs. Until <laughs> he was addicted and he could not concentrate in school. So he had been using since he was 16, now he's 21. And he struggled. He's, he, he, he did finish school, yes, mm. but he's delayed going to campus. He's going to rehab afraid he's going to be married. And most parents worry about the gap. This is a child who has finished his high school. He's then unable to proceed with other studies because of addiction. Mm. And he hasn't admitted he was taking cocaine or something like that. Wow. And you know, that one doesn't have a smell. <laughs> that one, e- either you look at the symptoms, maybe the withdrawal symptoms, yeah. or you notice a child is withdrawn, or you notice um, um, something amiss, but they've missed it out completely. And now he's 20, he's 21. He should have been in a uh, campus at the age of 19. He's lost three years. You know? So this is a parent who was just reaching out and asking, mm. what can you do? I'll speak to your parents, a clinical um, psychologist, a family therapist. Because most people who are taking drugs or are in addiction, you have to address it from, from um, <laughs> you cannot just... Um, seek out therapy for the person affected yeah. um, or in addiction, you have to also uh, involve those who is within around, their circle. And most kids in the family. Because yeah. it, um, it takes place within a context and there are perhaps yes. other underlying issues that yeah, also yeah, inform yeah. some of these addictions. So in your case, yeah. after finishing your... <laughs> So in flying school, it was just experimenting. There was no addiction, there was no dependence. Mm. It is just that I was introduced in that mm. environment. Yeah. Yes. Well, you can go on, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but there's a turning point yeah. to it because you're saying after flying school, you you wanted to do more. You wanted yes. to, I mean, but that didn't happen. Yeah. Why didn't and happen. how did that then so impact? So that's where everything changed. Like you're saying, um, after getting my license, and I'm waiting to go where I told you, yeah. <laughs> very ambitious, um, my parents were quick to just um, mention that they were going through something mm. else financially. So as they sorted themselves out, um, they requested that I go to the university that I go to the university mm. and pursue um, some course, either a diploma, as they sorted themselves out. 
<laughs> they're still soaking themselves out. <laughs> so what happened is I went to the university. Obviously, I went with my results slip. They looked at my results slip. They were able to check. They found out I'd been called to Kenyatta University to pursue a degree in nutrition. To me, um, that was the worst day of my life because I knew automatically if you've been called to university, ah, that's the end and of they your are flying going dream. Through something, then they would be they would be the most excited. So for me, I received it negatively because I knew there goes my flying career, and I purposed when I go home I won't let them know. Remember when I was going to the university, I'd been also referred to a family friend who was a professor. So obviously he knew the news, he, he, he had the information. And before I got home, there was a celebration. I found Whoa. people celebrating. Otherwise, I admit publicly that yeah. they, they had not been told by that third party. I probably would have kept the information to myself. Because that, that had come to interfere. You know, that's my 18-year-old mind thinking, mm. but what is this thing that has come to interfere with my career? You know, female pilots were few at that time. <laughs> so, so I wanted to be amongst, you know, the pioneers. Yes. And, you know, so what is this thing that has come to interfere with my life? So when I got home, it was celebration. And, and I understand where the celebration mm. was because as a first girl called to university by merit, and and I went, and off to Kenyatta University, I went. Um, <laughs> uh, the fact that also it was a public school, a university, <laughs> I was not used to public. I'm being honest here. That's my 18 year old self saying, "What? But I'm not used to this." I struggled, so I would go to class, study, but. Any opportunity I got, I'd be at the student center having a drink. So now that's where that habit, you know, when you're not happy, um, you pick something that will help you cope, something that will help you cope. So for me, what I learned, the, uh, the alcohol helped me cope, and the, and the cigarettes helped me cope. So things wow. that I had picked up in flying school then is what I was now consuming. Um, in campus. Wow. So when I was not in class, when I was not um, uh, studying, I would be at the student center enjoying myself. Yeah, and that came with um, some challenges because when you're tipsy or drunk, people can take advantage of you. There was an attempted rape that also made me uh, perceive men in a totally different way because these are people close to you. Yeah, there was an incident that happened even when I reached out for help because the first place I went after that incident was um, to report it. Number one, um, I smelt of alcohol. And number two, I had a swollen lip which I had acquired fighting off this guy who was in my room. He had stayed on um, after we had gone out to the student center to have drinks. They, we were about four of us. So it was obvious I was not able to go out that night with them. So it's kind that they brought me back to my room. But in the middle of the night, I wake up to someone touching me. And a, a fight ensued. So I thought I would fend him off by playing alone and then biting him and yeah. trying to do all these things. Eh? And the guy beat me back and I had this swollen lip and it was a fight. It was, it was, um, it was, oh. That one, I, I, I always remember that night because it, it was one of those um, situations you don't want to be because you're helpless. You're trying to beg, you're trying to push. Someone is pushing you down. Yeah. So he had, so at one point, and I'm crying and I'm bleeding with a swollen lip now. And um, I know he, he stopped and he said, the devil. He said, devil. So even before he went further, and I was, I had to pull to get out to go to the toilet. I'm telling him, get out. Him, his concern is 
obviously in a female hostel mm. at what time of the night and say it's a devil oh, don't go you go say whatever whatever so he finally let me go to uh, let me go and i went to the washroom i remember coming back and finding him at the at the door with the guard and i was wondering what is going on and they were talking i'm crying i have a swollen lip i just entered the room and, and, and shut the door in the morning already it was morning that was three instead of 30. i that's when i went looking for help and that's why i'm saying number one uh, that's madam <laughs> are you sure so when you went to report this to the police station the police Yes. So the police are the ones interrogating you, asking Not you if you're Madame, sure. Yeah. <laughs> is it a boyfriend who... So I remember passing by a, a friend of mine uh, place. Um, I didn't talk much. I couldn't even share what had just happened. But I went just to... to I must have wanted to share, but I wasn't able. You know how you have a friend? Yeah. <laughs> He must have known I was not okay. So he just told me, you know, you, yeah, you're going home, just go home, do what you need to do. I hope everything is okay. Yeah, everything is okay. Got home. The first thing my mom noticed was my swollen leaf. And she was asking, are you okay? I said, I'm going to get up from the bed. How will I tell her that I was drunk? This alcohol that <laughs> I had been cautioned about. Then over for the weekend and on Monday I had to go back to university and there was a discourse and a talk about having at some certain hostel at a certain event. And what did I do? I blocked to course. So I got used to the stairs, I got used to the discourse and I coped by twenty one. So at this stage... But remember, I would drink, but ensure I go to class and do my study. Mm. But the thing that gave me confidence was my drink. So it's possible for someone to be so good in class and yet so sold out when it comes to, you know, alcohol and all that, you know. Is it possible no, to serve... Let me just explain it like this. Um, People do have a social drink, and that's normal. I'll go out, have one beer, or a glass of wine. But there are people who drink to get high. They have the first drink, the second, the third. So I was that who would not drink just to get mellow. I would drink to get high. I would drink to get high. And so at this stage, you're actually hooked now. It's, mm, it's or you... It, it became a routine. Okay. Because again, when you get high, you also know the limits because you are the one who's taking yourself to mm. the hostel. You're the one who is taking care of yourself. Um, then it stopped being um, drinking with friends to drinking alone. Because if you're drinking to get high, the people who will are obviously concerned are you not drinking too much? Yeah. Like that's your fifth drink and you're driving. Are you okay? But no, I wasn't driving in, in campus. So, yeah. But now later on in life. So you you now withdraw or cut off from your circle. Because they will always raise that concern. So, you don't drink. You don't drink. Mm. <laughs> so when those, those questions started coming up, I then drink with strangers or drink alone. Or oh, you, you change, you change you your... Change. Because at the back of your mind, there's some form of guilt, but that you're trying to suppress. <laughs> or oh, what is it? Honestly, oh, um, I, I don't understand the guilt. Like when you drink, when you're yes, going out. Yes, yes. Obvious. Every time I would, I would drink and had too much. Obviously, it's the hangover or um, just the fact that I, I was out too late. Obviously, you, I feel too guilty. Mm. Um, then I ah, get over it and look forward to the next drink of the draw lot. So what? What? But it was in campus. It was not during the class time. Mm. But I drank too much. 
you know, they ask you if you have, um, um, how do you know someone has attention problem? Number one, it interferes with your normal activity. Number two, if even eyes are noticing that you're taking too much, you know. Number three, when everything else stops being a priority and it's alcohol. So that's how you can know someone is having an addiction or yeah. challenges. So there's quite these questionnaires you can ask yourself. Um, there's a question. Oh, there's some questions you can ask so that you can know where you are. Drinking responsibly or not. Is there even anything called drinking responsibly? I don't even agree <laughs> to that terminology. In fact, when you come to understand what our CBA is about, we're just saying um, because alcohol has been socially accepted for centuries all over the world, it doesn't matter that it is a toxic. Described by World Health, World Health Organization describes alcohol as a, psycho, a toxic psychoactive substance that has dependence properties it is a drug mm. it has dependence properties so you take it today tomorrow the day after and the day after like a drug you get used to it you stop taking you have withdrawal symptoms so for us we are advocating for more information to the public by the manufacturer mm. so even when they say responsible what do you mean responsible it's not excessive alcohol that is harmful to your health it's the latest scientific evidence that shows even that glass of wine can expose you to breast cancer. It causes over 200 diseases. It's it, 3 million people die yearly because of alcohol, either on the road, either due to these non communicable diseases uh, like uh, liver cirrhosis. Um, we're talking about high blood pressure. We're talking about strokes. We're talking about different cancers from throat cancers to stomach cancers. Remember, it is a toxic psychoactive substance with dependence properties so that that is what we, we we are about education do you know that even a small amount of alcohol can damage you if i knew perhaps uh, when i started drinking mm -hmm. at that tender age that alcohol poses health risks i don't think do i think i would have engaged in that but I believe it is curiosity that led to that, that pressure to experiment that led to indulging in those yeah. things that I became dependent on as a coping mechanism over the years. Because even after high uh, campus, I got my first job, international job. I covered my Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And uh, I remember um, there's a lot of travel all over Kenya into Tanzania, into Uganda. The, the, the head office for Africa was in Johannesburg, in South Africa. The home office was in um, California. So every year, California, once or twice in a year in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. the calendar monthly, you have to be either in Uganda, someplace. And after every meeting, remember I'm a nutritionist. I've studied nutrition, I've gotten my job as a product manager, so I'm educating on the role of these nutrients to the body. And I would pop these supplements and I would really eat well, because I knew at that point, alcohol, I'm taking it in large quantities. And it, it, it has harmful effects to the body, obvious. So that's how I lived for so many years. Wow. Yeah. And, and because now, this is something that you know, you began just as an experiment, you know, out of pressure, mm -hmm. if everybody is doing it, I mean, what's the big deal? Because that's how people find themselves in this territory of drug addiction. Mm -hmm. But now it has gotten to a point where you can't survive without, you know, you, you're more or less thinking about it more than you're thinking about any other thing in life. You're prioritizing it yeah. over your work, you're taking risks with alcohol, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, you know, so yeah. what depth did it sink you, especially during that uh, time when you were having this, what you would call a glamorous lifestyle because you have a good job, you're traveling all over the place and yet you have an addiction to sustain. Maybe at that point you don't even it term it yeah. as an addiction. Oh, yeah. By the time you're even um, admitting that I am an addict, 
Ooh, we probably have gone through a lot of denial. Yeah. But when we go through the simple questions to check whether this has become um, an addiction or a dependence, well, it's, it's a journey. Mm. Um, I only admitted I was addicted this year. <laughs> when God <laughs> tells me you have to share your story, I was thinking, you mean I was addicted? Me? <laughs> so I never even thought I had an issue. But obviously there was extremes. There was... Um, Wow. <laughs> Over the years, it got worse towards the end. Yeah, mm. uh, perhaps um, going to work late or to an event because of uh, of indulging a previous night. Um, <laughs> some accident on the road. You you you, a you 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 say it. You say it so calmly, some accidents. <laughs> it was not choice. And I can laugh now, but you see people die every day, even now. Yeah. You know, they're in, people are endangering lives when they, when they say that the car knows it's still there. You know, like mm. you've had your drinks. And then you, you know, ah, I know this one, I'm okay. And you get home. But I've had an accident. In fact, there's one that I'll never forget, and I've shared it um, once in, in another in person, another platform. I remember going for a function uh, to someone's home, um, coffee farm, mm -hmm. and um, I had a few glasses of wine. Then I must have been angry. No, no, I don't remember. I just told you, left in a half. They say they tried to stop me from leaving, but I left. Now, as I drove, I missed my turn to go in a certain direction. I found myself in the other direction. You connected. Not, not even me now saying it's now. Yeah. After the accident, is when you realize I, I was in the wrong road. It was a drizzling, it was a, a, a night that was raining. I remember um, hitting a pothole and just seeing the dear hole turn and fall into a shallow what do they call it a shallow valley and my car hung like this it's the bonnet so I'm hanging on the my cliff safety. <laughs> <laughs> the road is here yes. there's a deep valley on that side yes. and a shallow one yeah. I hit bottom instead of it going that side, oh, which would like automatically okay, go, okay. it came to this shallow side. And a car stopped. A guy oh. tried to help me out. And uh, he tells me, he tells me <laughs> that we're in a very dangerous place and we'll wait uh, until the tow truck comes. You know? And sure enough, he didn't take more than two, three minutes and we broke in from the bush. And obviously, they were coming to see what is this noise and what's the drama. But this guy stayed with me. The tow truck came. They pulled it and he left. I asked him for his number. I said, ah, you don't need my number. You know, I just stopped because I can't imagine walking away from an accident knowing how notorious this place is. Mm -hmm. So I remember being told they parked my car outside. Um, uh, they didn't even take it to the police station because I said emergency. Yeah. It would have made things worse for you. Oh my God. So they parked it at the parking well um by from a, I had an office uh, somewhere around that area. And I and I went home. I went home and I remember all along, even when the accident happened, I was just thinking of my son. He was very young then. Thinking, oh my goodness, and his name and his he would always come to my mind because I would imagine, oh, we'll take care of him, <laughs> uh, we'll mm. take care of him. And even after that incident, I still maybe I, I, I took a few a week or two to absorb that the vehicle didn't go to the other side, but I just found myself. Back, I fled. So even that scary incident, incident was not enough to counter 
the pull towards alcohol. Wow. Is that that's, what you... And that's what I'm saying, that's not normal. Yeah. Um, explain. What is this thing that you're taking that has endangered your life like once or twice? Because we've seen yeah. people, you know, relatives who really have tried their best, you know, mm-hmm. to pull their loved ones from this mm-hmm. addiction thing. Is it even... I mean, perhaps there's more to it in terms of... Uh, I, I always encourage you. You can look at it in different dimensions. But if you have someone who's in addiction, just seek out professional help. There are very many um, recovery centers, rehabilitation centers. Use the professional means where it's where you are able to, number one, get assessed. Number two, offer the necessary um, assistance. And especially the professionals from the psychiatrists to psychologists. To be able to, to to take them to to recovery, and uh, I always say kindness, empathy is very important. Yeah. But yes, then again, it can. There's also this angle of the spiritual way. You know, it could be um, bondage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it it it, it it's a. <laughs> yeah, it it could be you know. And especially if you sit down and look at the patterns, are there patterns, you know, if you were drinking, is there anyone else who uh, drinks extremely, you know, has extreme, has an addiction in your lineage or in your family, yeah? Could be a generational pattern <laughs> from no. alcoholism, like I was. I didn't go to rehab, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I didn't and and, and rehab. that's another story yeah. for you, yeah. you know. That so. one was just, but th- there's, there's very many angles to it. Mm. Um, people say it's genetic, you know, you're genetically dis- uh, predisposed. Others um, um, talk about it, but they are saying, you know, it could be. Yeah. Wow. So, for you, what are some of the weirdest <laughs> things, you know, or events that happened in your life as a result of, you know, this new friend that you had introduced in your life yeah. in the name of alcohol. Mm. You know, now that you think about it, of course, it's now in the past, but yeah, it's, it's a gone. past that informs a lot of things. Sure. Even, uh, you know, some of the interventions that you're putting in place right now yeah. as a result of, you know, uh, those experiences that you went through. Sure. Looking back, what is it that you know maybe stands out for you in terms of the depth that you had sunk and the <laughs> <laughs> the effect that that had on you and to those around you? Wow, um, probably three of them. Number one, these times you know you you the extremes. I probably I did this a couple of times. It's something common that <laughs> happens where you buy drinks for the whole club. They're strangers, you don't know them. <laughs> that happens. See <laughs> story. You know, I tell you. I'm wondering what is that? You don't even know anyone. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of, I think, wastage. I mean, and, and I think it's because people who drink like the company. <laughs> so you will keep buying others, even strangers, drinks. You have no clue who they are. But you're bonding over something that is common. Mm. It's their drink. And they're not complaining. Remember, you've been drinking to an extent where you're not, no longer going to your local or you only go to your local because the local understands you. Yeah. You know, the local pub is usually that place where you will always be a common fixture if you're not going out to other places that uh, either are more... <laughs> better or you've been invited, things like those, you mm-hmm. know, buying people alcohol, the risks, you know, the, the, I remember also having drinks once with some people and leaving um, the place but not remembering at all, only to find myself in a car park and I'm, I'm, and I'm okay in my, in, the, in, in, in the passenger's car side and I'm wondering, okay, where am I? And there's a guy who's telling me, hey, your car, I took recording so that I, I can show you what happened. Your car was stalled on a bump on Riara Road. There's a vehicle behind you. 
that had three guys. It must have been. It was there when I was walking up, going to my apartment. And because cars were passing by, you know, Yara Road is narrow. And so he says he, as he came up, he saw there's a car that is stalled. And no one is stopping. And he was curious. It wasn't far from his gate. And as he got closer, he noticed it was a woman. When he got closer, he noticed the vehicle behind was not moving like the others that were overtaking. And he got concerned. He got to his gate, asked the watchman, hey, yeah, you haven't seen that vehicle. And the watchmen were very busy minding their business because, <laughs> you know, they don't want to interfere because mm. of the car behind. He tells me, this man says he it was like a push from God to just go check out if I was okay. He comes, he finds a black dot on the steering wheel. As he crossed to come to the vehicle already, the, the people in the car behind are making faces to threaten, but he got a certain courage because... He's thinking if they were together, they would have helped. These guys are not good guys. And he's already told his watchmen to watch out for him. So they have come out of the gates. This is a story he's telling me. So he gets into, he, he struggles to push me to the passenger side. He sits into the drivers. And that's the parking that he parked in. And I couldn't stay there. You know, when I, when now I came to, he had given me a lot of water. So all this time, you, 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 you've lost touch. You, I don't you've know. blacked I don't out. That. I you... don't remember that part. So he was quick to give me water. So now I've come and I'm, I'm two, and he's telling me, you don't even seem drunk. You seem like you were spiked your drink. He says he had been studying Muchele for some time, and I exhibited all symptoms. <laughs> And I told him, yeah, where I came from, I just drank one glass of wine because it was that year I had already asked God, you know what, this drinking has to come to an end. So I had switched from whiskey to one or two glasses of wine. So for me as well, I was shocked um, uh, because I remember where I came from, where I had drinks with those people, I had a glass or two of wine. So what happened? Yeah. Um, when... Um, when he's told me he thinks I've been spiked, I say, fine, but I'm better now. I need to go. So I left, got home, woke up okay the next day. I must have given him my number because I got a WhatsApp and the guy was introducing himself. I would not have remembered if he didn't send me a WhatsApp. Those things that you forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's the damage that drugs do to you. Wow. If it was Michele or whatever it was, but any time you drink and you black out, then yeah. it means it's so damage to nerves. Yeah. So this guy WhatsApps me. He tells me his name. He tells me where we met. And he describes. And I remember, oh, yeah. I remember the car park. And I tell him, let's meet. I'd rather meet you and here. So we met at Junction. He showed me the videos. It was, called, you know, like someone who had actually been drugged. drugged. Yeah. But I thank God because many people don't survive such incidents. Yeah. He tells me the reason he helped me is because he was just seeing that vehicle of three guys and seeing the headlines, woman found, gone forest. Hmm. <laughs> and the car has been sold <laughs> as crop metal or something. So he's, he's telling me that's what pushed him, that even if he was intimidated intimidated by the guys who were behind my vehicle, and he always wants to know who are those guys. That day, I called um, the person who I had met the previous night, and the first thing he asked me, you are alive. I've never talked to him since. Mm. And that was in 2016, must have been mid-2016, because what does it mean, you're alive? What does yeah. that mean? I've never wanted to know what that means. <laughs> Wow. Like, because ah, there's some so, things you just let go. But drinking exposed me to a lot of harm. So clearly, you really were not in a position to, by your own, you know, will and power, yeah. to detach yourself from this entanglement of some sort yeah, that you explain, had found yourself. Yeah, explain how, even after such an incident of 
the three men behind my vehicle, I still went out and drunk. So yeah. where so d- where old. did your ma- ma- <laughs> what, what the Damascus your Damascus? <laughs> oh, they had oh thank God. You know the because then <laughs> you're seated here, collected, <laughs> calm, you know everything, yeah. looking all pretty <laughs> and you know, but the person you're describing and the person we are seeing today are two different people. What happened? You know you know, like I said, I would a functional let's just call it functional alcoholic. Yeah? you know how to be calm and collected. By the way, many people assume that I may have looked a certain way then. In fact, you would never have suspected. If you go through my photos or you experienced me then, you never know I had a challenge. But those close to me, my family, my colleagues, yeah, those people close to you are the ones who can tell you, hey, that girl, she drinks a lot. But now when you're out maybe in the field or doing your work, they're not going to experience you, say, in the evening, yeah? And, 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 and so many people ask me, Katha, you say you were addicted, but we never saw it, huh? <laughs> I couldn't wait to get a drink after work kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So Damascus moment was, a lot of things happened in 2016, and I was just sick and tired of, of the accidents, the summonings, you know, obviously my parents would summon me and, you know, ask what is going on. Is there anything you need? You know, because um, even if I was not living with them, I was dropping my son every opportunity I'd get over the weekends. Even the ones that I was not working so that I can go have a drink. So at one point, it was evident that your drink is causing you to lose control so um, I think that year I was just telling God I just need to be able to not desire the drink and even if I have to drink please let me not be compulsive (laughs) where I want to drink in bottles you know and um, by mid of that year I had gotten into a prayer program that I connected with online. It was an academy for six months. And I started understanding spiritual things. We were brought up in a Christian home. So this was uh, in a, desire, a desire I from looking. within. Yes. No one was pushing you oh, to no, this. Oh, no. But obviously you know what it's doing. Yeah. I have a son. Uh, I know, I know. Um, instead of spending enough time with him, there are times that I'm mostly hanging out, you know. And when I hang out, I'm having drinks. That's where the fun is, yeah? So, I, I, and I felt like if I didn't stop on time, then we would not have a relationship. How will he grow up, you know? And that, this came up because of the near-death incidences. Mm-hmm. Because any time I got into a situation that was dangerous, the first person that cropped into my mind was my son. Because we have a great family, but who's going to take care of him? Yeah. So... The, uh, so that year, joined academy, the prayer academy in June. I reduced my drink gradually. You know how you, you you're telling. <laughs> you, transformation didn't happen overnight. Mm. You know how you've accepted the Lord, and you're walking this journey. But the turning point was, twenty third of December, of twenty sixteen. I had gone out, got home at around one or two. Slept, had a dream, saw my death near my local. It was a head-on collusion, you know how you see out-of-body experience and you're like, huh, there's an accident here. Who is here? (laughs) I saw myself and it was clear. Okay, talk. You get out to go have another drink. Ah, you won't go back home. And I'm thinking, my dreams do come true. (laughs) That one was like, oh. And in that dream, it was full of bottles of uh, wine and serpents, you know, crawling uh, snakes. And in the dream, it's like I'm being told it's it's greater than just the drink. There's mm. a hold, a stronghold. And that's why I believe there are strongholds. Spiritually, there's something that can tie you down. You try all methods, scientific approach, <laughs> all kinds of things, and you're unable because there's a demonic tie. 
So when I saw all those snakes and all those things, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. When I woke up, I don't know if it is this, the dream that scared, but the urge to drink and smoke disappeared. Just like that? Just like that. I, that day, I, w- I had planned to to go out. There's something called Kutua Lok. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And you know, that's also another sign. Why are you, you have a hangover, but you can't wait to go add more alcohol to feel okay. It means your tolerance has gone higher. There's a problem. And many Kenyans, <laughs> their tolerance levels have increased over time. There's a problem there. Remember, alcohol is a toxic, psychoactive, uh, uh, with with properties that are depend with dependence properties, so you become dependent on it, and for you to get high, you need more quantities over time. That's the story of so many people's lives. So that night was a turnaround. Never craved alcohol. Never craved a smoke. So my life it went dark. It doesn't. It doesn't make normal make sense. Normal sense. Yeah. And what happened then is. Oh, I used to drink. I used to drink alcohol. <laughs> so you you didn't so go to any rehab. To... I didn't go to any rehab. I didn't. Um, and yet, I I had. I used to uh, talk about nutrition, um, in healing, um, in nutrition therapy in in rehabs. Mm. You know, because alcohol does damage a lot. So these rehabs I used to work for. But after work, I go and I drink. What? I'm thinking, am I even me? I'm, I'm, I'm an alcoholic and you're in denial. Yeah, those are conversations I would have with myself. So once um, I noticed the craving was gone, I don't desire. Life went by, sober, okay. Until this year in March, six years later. Yeah. Because that was December of 2016. This is my fifth year, 11th month sober. So in March, uh, I had very clearly on first, second, and third that I needed to share my story. Number one, because um, I struggled. I struggled. Those years were of struggle when I was drinking. The accidents, yet by God's grace, I was saved. Never had a scratch, never admitted, yet I was exposed to so much harm. So number one, that was the reason. Number two, to to reduce for the, the for for healing purpose. You know, many people don't believe in divine healing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But me, I say, God, God rescued me from the deepest pits. That was, it's just the hand of God that got me out of there. Yeah. Uh, so God needs this message that you may be in the darkest hole, addicted to pornography, masturbation, or alcohol. Yeah. And if you hear my story that one night I slept an alcoholic, woke up, free then it is possible and the same bible it says faith pleases god so have faith if you're believing in something it is possible Mm -hmm. so even as i speak and also add my voice in the space of alcohol drugs awareness prevention and advocacy i am quick to mention that mine is just by the grace of god it is by the yeah. grace of God because and, I mean yeah. we hardly hear uh, those uh, turning points yeah. where someone can't really explain yeah. how they detach. In fact, yeah. I hear that the most difficult part of this journey is you know even for those who have who are willing to let go of alcohol, the most difficult part is that now the the transitioning period. You know, yes, withdrawal. Withdrawal. I mean, yeah, mm. yeah. And yet, for you, mm. this is not anything you've actually struggled Nothing. with. Somehow, God, in His own mysterious yes. ways, yeah, was able to, you know, unhook you mm. with without much. Yeah. So, I mean, I know we are we are racing against time. Yeah. But for the sake of those who perhaps then are asking. So what now? <laughs> you know. Remember, I still have my career. 
as a nutritionist, I still functioned in my role. Eh? So um, I still continue to do that profession till today. Um, three, three months ago, um, we formed a community-based organization. Um, let me take it back. When God instructed I share, the first person I reached out to was a man who I really totally respect. <laughs> Uh, his, his name is Bonnie Face, and um, I had worked in his rehab, uh, you know, speaking to parents about nutrition, getting their, their, their loved ones onto some programs, you know. And I remember asking him in March, because I looked for him, I asked him, did you ever notice I had maybe um, I was alcoholic or anything? And he says, I, I never noticed because you never came drunk or mm. anything. But I had interacted with him after work. And he's like, I, I never noticed it. So I told him I struggled. And that's where he shared Solomon Kilanga's story. Yeah. It's like, hey, have you seen the story of this guy who was in the street? His father was a pilot, his mom was a businesswoman. I'm like, no. And I watched it. I had never thought of street people being... I, I just thought street men or women are people who grow up as children into adults, huh? not knowing that people would drift because of addiction into the street. So something drew to me to Solomon's story. And I looked for him, and I looked for GLC, where he has a center. And I started volunteering, not knowing that this same center is going to help somebody who I shared the video with. And I think that's the genesis of how you reached out to me mm. when I tagged you. Mm. Because I tagged you to say, I saw um, Boniface, share, Boniface shared Solomon Kilanga's story that he did with shared moments at Justice. And because of that, there's people who I knew who went through GLC. And now they are on the path of recovery and they graduated recently. So, I, I mean, <laughs> just... That humbles me because this is the one person that I know who has gone through recovery, who had been addicted for years, mm. who had been hospital hospitalized not once, not twice. He'd been to many rehabs. And now he's gone through this one that I connected through an online program. I mean, that can only be an act of God. And remember, I didn't know the guy was struggling with alcohol yeah. when I started volunteering at GLC. So one day, uh, Solomon takes me to see some women somewhere in Ruiru. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> led to our commercial, uh, our co co community-based organization, thinking about also the women who are trying to get out of situations where they feel stuck mm -hmm. and are unable. Yeah, And just like any addiction, you have to address the mind. You have to get them psychosocial support. You have yeah. to understand what are the underlying cause of all this. There has to be something that happened that caused them to need to depend on something, either the sex or the alcohol, to cope or to feel okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a group of women we've been visiting in that area. It's called Masaku. They live in that area and they are known commercial sex workers. They're all addicted to some, some, some substance. They're all addicted to some substance. So the day I went there, I thought it was just going to be a regular visit. <laughs> like, yes, I've come, I've seen. But when I got into the compound, I, it is the children. I probably will show you a photo. I've covered the faces. It is the children. It was about the children. When this woman said they're second, third generation prostitutes who never went to school because their mothers didn't take them to school because their mothers or aunties were, were commercial sex workers, that they've grown up in 12 years, 13, 14, doing that. They're not about the children. Yeah? So that's when we decided to set up a center and get those who are willing. You know the people who, <laughs> like the way you're saying, in most rehabs, they don't admit people who are not willing yeah. to get the help. So if there are willing women there, we're going to help them. We've got a center, we've got a, a place in Gibiga. 
We're just waiting for some resources, some funds. But it is going to be a six-month program where, number one, they go through the recovery with the support of professionals. Then equip them with social cycle, uh, uh, socioeconomic, this is socioeconomic empowerment, yeah. so that they can be able to fend for themselves. So we are actually looking for partners. It could be corporates, public, private sector, just partners, people who uh, feel for those people who are in their worst places and they are unable to get out. Mm -hmm. And why I believe there is hope is just from that encounter with those women. Like I said, we go there often. We go fellowship with them. We read the word of God. We pray with them. They've become friends. We laugh with them. We, I keep telling about them about this center. And to believe me that mm. at the time next year, we will be in Dubai laughing, celebrating because we are going to talk to other women who are in their situation and that there's a possibility that they can get out. You just need to have faith. So one of those days we went out there and one of the ladies always drunk. Um, if I'm looking for a baby <laughs> to buy, she has one. And everyone looks at her and they're wondering, what do you mean? And we realize her belly was not just big. She is pregnant. And we interrogate her. And she says, and I think I'm nine months. So that is the day I, I thought, oh my goodness, what is this? So the baby that she was saying, uh, if you were interested, is she... Is the one that she's carrying. Her own baby. Her own baby. Because if she's a commercial sex worker... And now she's expecting where, and she has two other children. Where mm -hmm. is she going to take this child? I remember looking for a place for her, um, a, 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 a maternity cover for her. I knocked at doors, finally got uh, someone who was willing. When she's ready to give birth, they'll, they, they'll take care of her. Mm -hmm. The lady called a week later, and she was admitted at um, Comarock Modern. She was there for three days. And Usikine came in and gave her a, a two-week um, stay at a safe house because where is she going back to? Yeah? So for me, hearing that at the hospital she went, the doctors said if she had not come that night, mother and unborn child would have died. Isn't that the hand of God? It's not even about me anymore. Just God placing people at the right place at the right time with a heart, a heart of God to help those in need. The child is alive. The mom is alive. We have moved her now to another place so that she can now continue with her life. But she still needs help and amongst other many. So I've just mentioned a few yeah. stories that keep me going, that there is nothing coincidental. Yeah. That child that was born that would have Otherwise, no chance to yeah. leave or the mother who had no chance to live as well, is the reason now we are doing these things. Yeah? But uh, we, need, we need interventions that are going to help. Yesterday we were out in the street, and there's so many people who are on the medical-assisted treatments. But once they are done with the medical-assisted treatments, they have nothing to do. So if, we, if, if government can get involved, we get these people into programs, you know, um, and 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 get them equipped with skills, then we can talk of Wanjiko, um, bottom up people being helped to get back on track because many people do sleep, and it doesn't matter your social economic, uh, it doesn't matter your social status. Yeah, people are getting addicted in Runda, in, in Karen, and so they are in Madare. It's even worse because of the illicit brew. It's more lethal. Yeah. Clearly, mm. Katha, mm. the menace, the whole menace, mm. uh, what drug, alcohol, drug, substance abuse has, uh, you know, exposed us to mm. as a as a society. Mm. The effects are far reaching, mm. 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 and uh, clear. This is not financially. Um, people in the training area, people in 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 uh, willing to just support people in recovery. Yeah. They can reach out to me. I believe right. you, you'll share the details. Yes, we, uh, we are also having the first sober living youth summit um, in Kiambu County in this month of November on the 30th. 
and our target is the youth, 18 to 25 year olds, college going students, those people, you know, I wish I went to such an event mm. to understand. Mm. <laughs> and what we've lined up is we are addressing mental health, alcohol and drugs, and social economic empowerment and so we've partnered we've yeah. partnered with nakada we've partnered with organizations in the mental health in alcohol and drugs and uh, we're also still looking for more partners but the agenda will be having professionals in all those fields in a panel we can have these discussions and even the the audience will be able to ask and uh, there will obviously be organizations that have pitched tents yeah. from counselors to rehab centers to organizations that probably have internship for the youth yes. so that we can have conversations and have these young people interact with um, people in who, who, who perhaps have a lived experience, people who uh, can mentor them, but then encourage a sober life. And sober could mean, yes, free of yeah. drugs, but mm. so, sobriety just means clarity, mm. yeah? Clarity. We don't want to be clogged in mind, you know? We don't want to be bound in different addictions. We want to have a clear mind. Yes. And when you start early, then you're assured of a great future with no distractions or delays. I'm, I'm very quick to say maybe I had to go through all what I did so that I can be a testimony to someone who has struggled, struggled yeah. for 16 years in alcoholism or 40 years in alcoholism, yeah. or even that one year, or, or, or thinks that it's not possible. There's definitely yeah. a language that you can speak yeah. that uh, someone yeah. who has not been in True. that shoes uh, might not be able to articulate, and that yeah. will resonate True. with uh, the person who actually is seeking help. Mm. And mm. so I believe God has put you here for a reason, sure. and it's evident from the few examples you've yeah. you mentioned. And I know there's more. Oof. You know, <laughs> only that time cannot allow us. I've tried to see, and, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, but you know, within that this very short you know period of time, yeah. you've done so much, mm. and this is this is your call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is your call. So yeah. we wish you nothing less than God's blessings. Thank you. Even as you, you know, make, you know, go ahead mm. and for the upcoming event, yes. this is not just an event, yes. but I believe it's a beginning of uh, sure. a ministry Amen. that will make a difference that uh, we so desperately need. I'll even just interject and say, we, we would want a movement, you know, of people on ground after the youth come to the event. Yeah. Obviously, there's a way we'll partner with them. And wherever they're going, we can be able to get movements in their neighborhoods, in their machinani places, in their yeah. colleges, just spreading a message of positivity and sober living and get this sober living into every county. And that's why we're partnering with county governments. We want to urge uh, governors to partner with us, uh, members of parliament, because they're the ones, or members of the county assembly, because they're the legislators. They can be able to pass laws that will protect us, yeah. you know, especially from the harm uh, uh, caused by this alcohol. And uh, it's in these moments I appreciate Mutulu a lot because he came with a with a bill that became an act. Yeah. But today it's it's it holds no water yeah. for various reasons. And but yes, and 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 something can be done. We're sure, not attacking sure. them, you know, with blows, but we are reasoning and saying, just tell us the truth that yeah. this thing is harmful then people can make informed choices. Can we stop using influencers to market a product that is harmful? In Ghana, they don't use influencers to market anything that is harmful because alcohol has been known to cause accidents, to cause disease. So why should I, who has 50 million followers, endorse a product that is going to cause harm to many people? So those are the things we want to hear or to see. Although it is mainly through peer pressure people start taking all these things. Advertising also influences those in addiction Definitely. to be stuck there yeah. and those who have never drunk to be lured in. In fact, you just go into social media. The advertisements from the alcohol companies are alluring. They are so captivating. Oh, how they are marketing alcohol to the women today. You just go on to Kiamburo or any road. You'll count 
20 billboards. One is pink liquor for the girls. Another one is, I don't know what, for the men. Those are misleading. So we just need to have regulation. That's what I add, regulation in advertisement, regulation in the distribution, then also the illicit brews. Oh my goodness. That one, there has to be something done because that one is more lethal and is most common in low income areas. Who's going to talk on their behalf? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Surely yeah. there's yeah. there's work to do. <laughs> <laughs> and you have, you know, begun that yeah. good work. Yeah. And so we all we can do is to ask all of you to join the bandwagon yeah. yeah. and do the bit that you can because Nkatha cannot be everywhere. To do everything. You know, there's the much you can be able to do. True. But if all of us really uh, played our role, mm. then something something drastic will, sure. will be experienced, mm. especially here in this country. If we cannot, at this point in time, manage this yeah. crisis, mm. it's going to be catastrophic. Yeah. In a few years mm. to come, we will not even have a country. So mm. it sounds now that, like, you know, uh, something ordinary, normal, but I assure you, mm. it is not. It yeah. is not. Yeah. And so... We, these are the conversations that we encourage mm. all of us to have mm. so that we can really make a difference. Mm. Tonight has been one that uh, we have not interacted much with you. And <laughs> some of you have really been uh, uh, vocal in the chat section. I think at uh, the beginning we had some technical issues and all that and uh, issues with audio, volume and all that. I, I saw all of that so don't think that uh, we ignored you mm. but hopefully you have been able to uh, benefit from this conversation and learn something that mm. you can be able to uh, utilize out there. I already see, maybe let me just mention a few of you who have really been with us from the beginning even as I sign out and uh, Caroline Kagia is here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, I see you. And Moses Kokach, uh, you've been following as well. And uh, I have Shepherds Bond. Uh -huh. Sante Sana for watching. Jacqueline Nyango, you've been with us. Uh, Vicky Tenyo, wow. thanks for joining. Sad Shitawa, Karibu Sana. Josh, I see you. Elizabeth. Uh -huh. Aha, <laughs> Jerry Kabiru, uh, we have uh, Saida, and Saida also uh, said uh, that uh, she had lost, uh, I think she has lost someone and she couldn't continue uh, watching. We are spoiler sana Saida for the loss mm. to Kopa Moja. Mm. And uh, yeah, so many of you have really been. Uh, following the conversation mm, and we're really mm, grateful. Mm. Remember, you can catch this and many other conversations that matter to you every Friday mm. here on Shared Moments with Justice. And so, allow us to end it here. Can, can we just urge? Yes, please. Can, let's urge um, um, us to be our brothers keepers. Don't get tired um, reaching out to someone who you see is getting into the addiction or is in addicted, but be kind. Many people don't like being told, ah, when you live, it's you, did, 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 you know, such kind of things. Yeah. Just be kind, then uh, empathetic. That helps a lot. And I also urge our president, you know how people do a, a, a campaign on something? The way they did campaigns for the, the, their politics. I would, um, uh, William Ruto, Together with the deputy first lady, second lady, just come together and we do on alcohol and drugs. Just something um, that will be impactful. These are influencers. They are our leaders. I remember him uh, uh, telling his uh, uh, legislators when they, they, they were elected that there are times he has had to correct some of them when they drank too much. And he keeps telling them, yeah. if, if, if that thing, you can't take it, either stop it or reduce. If he can be a face of a campaign against alcohol and drugs in a way that is going to be impactful to deglamorize alcohol, I'm telling you, for me, I'm willing to work, Mr. President, with you. <laughs> and we can be able to change this, um, uh, you know, to change how um, people perceive alcohol and help 
uh, save our generation. That's wow. actually it. Because all we're doing now is to save the future generation. Sure, yeah. sure. Ten years from today, five years from today. So we need to be at the forefront. Na kwa hayo machache. The end. The end. Thank God. Thank you. For you and Thank the platform you. and just for inviting me. I'm so grateful. Asante I sana. pray the best for you mm -hmm. and your platform and even what you're doing with YouTube. Congratulations. And yeah, your star is lit. You're, 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 you're helping so many people. And um, I remember speaking to you and for you, it's not about the glamour. It's not yeah. about, it's about that one person, that one person. And that's what um, a God wink is that you've been allowed, you've allowed God to use you in mm -hmm. that kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Asante sana. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for staying up this late. Yes. You know, <laughs> don't take it for granted, yeah. my friend. You know, she's she's here this late. We're live in studio. This is live. <laughs> and she's on yeah. set yeah. with me. Yeah. It's such yeah. a sacrifice. Yeah. And so I'm really, you know, humbled and thank I'm you. grateful that you could be able to sacrifice everything to be here to do this. This shows how committed yeah. you are to this thank process. You. And for sure... God would reward this. Amen. <laughs> to Maliza show. Aye. 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 Sign out. I'm here. I was saying, you are ending it today. I can go on and on. I, I you should you should feel the presence of God in this place. <laughs> so we are going on and on. Um, I would urge you to uh, look out for me on Instagram as Miss Nkafa Mwenda. That is a, a platform that I use uh, much. And um, can I share my where our organization is? A if, telephone if, number. If that is information yeah. that you think yeah. would be helpful, so please Graceful go ahead. Youth Recovery Center is based in Kiambu County. Uh, you can get us on zero seven two two nine three four two seven three. We normally do outreaches, and um, you can come. Give your time.